part of our church family uh, for a long time. Uh, and this, this awesome person, uh, unfortunately for us, it's a bittersweet thing, I guess, because this person is going to be moving on to a new season of their lives. And so Tracy uh, is here. If she, she could come uh, make her, her way up here. Tracy, uh, and yeah, I, this is going to be speaking to the choir, but Tracy um, has been a huge blessing uh, to this church over the years. I've only known her for a couple, almost three years now, but um, I, I can uh, absolutely speak to that. Um, she's, she's a person who, who's always giving herself completely over to the task at hand, uh, most recently as our church custodian. Um, and so if you aren't aware that this is going to be Tracy's last Sunday with us uh, at Christian Life. Um, and so we are just so grateful, uh, and words can't truly express how grateful we are for the gifts that you've brought here and the lives that you've impacted and the lives that you've uh, changed and touched. And so uh, over the past few months, Tracy has uh, kind of felt an urging or maybe a calling uh, to head into something new, to head into something new. And so, uh, like I said, this will be her last Sunday with us. And so I, I would just encourage you after this, just just continue to uh, share share your love with her and uh, tell her and, and show her how much we appreciate uh, her. And so uh, as, as her church family, uh, we just want to help launch you into this next uh, season of ministry that you're heading into. And so uh, we wanted to present you uh, just with with a little gift uh, from from the church to you. Uh, I'm not even sure what's inside there, so it's going to be a surprise to you. Um, but it's it's just a little token of our appreciation, and so uh, and just to say thanks for all the different areas that you've served in. And so um, we're just going to pray over Tracy now. And if you guys could just extend a hand uh, towards her, let's let's just pray uh, over Tracy. So Lord, we just uh, we just. Lift Tracy up to you right now, Lord God. Uh, this amazing woman of God who, uh, who has been given uh, many gifts uh, and by you, God, and, and she's given her gifts uh, to this church, Lord God. And we're just so grateful. And Lord, uh, as she steps into this new season, uh, maybe a season of unknown, a season uh, where she isn't necessarily knowing where she's headed, God, I just pray uh, that you would be her, with her every step, that she would know that you are with her, Lord God, that you would guide her, that you would direct her steps, Lord God. Uh, take Take her into this new season, a, a season of life, a season of, of joy, uh, of overwhelming peace, Lord God, as she just continues to seek after your heart uh, and seek after your will, Lord God. And so we're just so grateful and thankful uh, for, for all that she's done uh, here for us and with us. Uh, and we're kind of jealous, God, uh, of all the stuff that she's going to do outside of here, Lord God. But we know that it's going to be all for your glory. And so we just bless that in Jesus' name. Amen. We love you, Tracy. We love you. Amen. So this morning, uh, Pastor Debbie and Joe, uh, I said that backwards, Pastor Joe and Debbie um, are away in Atlanta visiting family. They're going to be traveling back, uh, I believe, tomorrow. And so this morning, I have the privilege, the honor and the privilege of introducing our guest speakers this morning. Uh, Sean and Hannah Collings are an incredible young couple. That I've had the amazing opportunity to get to know over the past couple months, um, and they are they are a missionary woo, a missionary associates to Ecuador. Is that that's correct? Um, and are right now they're in the process of raising their funding and stuff to go down. Uh, and so this morning they're going to be sharing their heart and their vision for everything that's to come. And I can't wait uh, for you guys to get to know them just a little bit. Uh, let me just say that even though I've only known them uh, for a couple months, this is a uh, a couple that you, you just after meeting them you get the feeling that you've known them like forever, uh, for years and years. And so uh, even though uh, in meeting them, they beat me merciless, mercilessly in uh, Mario Party multiple times, like it was heartbreaking. Uh, they're going to make up for it this morning with their passion and their authenticity. And so please welcome, uh, help me welcome to the stage, uh, Sean and Hannah, as they come and minister to us this morning. Is it on? Is it on? Oh, good, good. <laughs> um, that was very kind, Blake. That was very kind. He didn't mention the fact that while he was playing, he got so upset that we were winning, he threw his, <laughs> he threw his controller and it like put two holes in the roof. So we'll just... <laughs> he's, a comp he's a competitive feller. If you're ever on a team with him, he's who you want in your corner. So 
Blake's a good guy. Um, but yes, as he said, I am Sean Collings. I know a couple of you because I grew up around this area. I got saved at the age of 15, just wandering around the streets of Mercersburg, and I found my way to a youth group, and then I experienced the Lord and got filled with the Holy Spirit, and I haven't looked back since. Um, and we're going to share just a little bit about what the Lord has been calling us to first separately and then together after we got married and stuff. So here's Hannah with that side of it. And then after that, um, I just really felt impressed by the Holy Spirit to share a message with you guys that's going to encourage you and strengthen you and call you um, to reach out and love well. I know you guys, uh, I've been welcomed in this church beautifully, but we can all love better, including myself. So I'm going to preach to me as well while I'm up here. So um, we love you. Thank you so much. Also, it's Memorial Day. When you think about it, say prayers for um, families who have lost, uh, you know, veterans and, and active duty and stuff. So um, as you go about your festivities, say a quick prayer for them. Yeah, so um, I am Hannah Collings. Um, I'm actually not from here. I'm from Louisiana. So if I have an accent, I apologize. It's just what it is. Um, <laughs> but And to give Blake a little less slack, I'm way more competitive than he is, and that's why I was winning. So, <laughs> um, But, yeah, so me and Sean, um, as Sean said, he got saved here in Mercersburg, or in Mercersburg, not here, um, but he got saved when he was much younger, and um, at a young age, when he was still in high school, he actually really felt the call for missions on his life. He took a couple trips down to Ecuador um, with his church, and uh, just really fell in love, like, with the ministry there, and also just with the call of missions, and how vital it was to him, and, and so he ended up going to South Carolina, and attending a ministry school um, called South Carolina School of Leadership, which I know some people went there, here, um, so it's cool to actually know people, because I don't know, know anybody up here, so it's kind of nice, um, but, and then um, I also attended this same school, um, and while I was actually attending the schools, when the Lord was really working on my heart for missions, um, I had no plan of that, um, I used to tell everybody I was going to marry rich, so I didn't have to work, so <laughs> that's kind of <laughs> terrible, but, you know, it's who I was, and so um, <laughs> the Lord really took a hold of my heart and um, showed me how big of a thing missions was going to be in my life. Um, but Sean and I will be doing missionary associate term with Doug and Carol Baldwin, which they, they are on you guys' wall back there, so that's pretty cool. Um, but we will be working with them. We'll be going to language school in Costa Rica for six months, and then we'll be working with them in Machala, Ecuador, for two years. While we'll be there, we'll just be kind of like their gophers, whatever they need us to do, we're going to be doing. Um, and we'll be serving in church plants, um, serving in the community. They have, like, kids' ministry services probably every day of the week. Um, they're always doing outreaches and um Machala is the size of like Pittsburgh, right? It's, that's, that's the size of the city. Um, and they only have like one AG church there. And so um, it's a huge, huge place to just reach out and really get our hands into everything we can. Um, but our heart really is for children and specifically special needs children. Um, we got to work with some when we were doing some work out in China and um, just they wrecked us, um, and the Lord really showed us how deserving they are of, um, you know, having a, having a normal life, a normal childhood, um, being able to grow and learn in their own way, um, and just because it looks different from our way doesn't mean it's the wrong way, it just is different, and so we really want to be able to facilitate that for children there. Um, also, we want to um, help with the, with families, because there, the special needs um, children are kind of like outcasted and they're really left inside of their homes some of them aren't able to attend schools and same with adults with special needs there and so we want to maybe start building small groups and things like that during our two years getting to know that community um, and yeah so we're super excited about that and um, we hope after these two years to come back and um, become career missionaries and return um, to Latin America and just keep doing what the Lord has called us to do. And so thank you so much for allowing us to share today. Um, we're just super excited to be with you all. And yeah, that's it. <laughs> thank you. She is beautiful, isn't she? 
<laughs> um, our the uh, really big dream that the Lord has put in us, like long term, really far down the road, is having our own um, like special needs foster care type orphanage. Um, in order to yeah yeah yeah, it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Down in down in Latin America, being able to not only um, you know fund the surgeries and do physical therapy, but really pray um, for the healing of the Lord in uh, each and every individual and stuff. So um, it'll be really fun. We have no idea what we're doing. Just absolutely no idea. But there's this huge call and this huge passion inside of us that the Lord's put there. And so we believe that these are the steps, you know, getting into the culture, learning the culture, learning how all that works is what we're going to be focusing on while we're in our two-year little itineration stuff. We can't start an orphanage right off the bat. I would would do terrible, but (laughs) um, that's what the Lord has called us to. So this this, uh, passage I'm going to share with you here, um, it goes alongside of our missions work as well. These three questions that I'm going to um, propose at the end of this or, or share with you guys at the end of this um, passage are really the driving force for why Hannah and I are doing what we're doing, why we just in every uh, like a daily type thing, we just press in and we try to love people and uh, reflect Jesus to them. So it's pretty big. And I'm going to share a quick story here. So I get a little bit like nervous speaking in front of people. Uh, just not, I don't have that gift, that natural confidence that Blake has, but I, (laughs) um, and I was thinking about it. It's like, where is this coming from? Like, it just can't be just there for no reason. And I thought back to one time I was sharing at a youth group. There were two students in the youth group and like nine or so leaders. And so it was a weird situation. So I was preaching to these two students. I mean, Zero students wouldn't have mattered, you know, preaching to the, to the leaders, doesn't matter. Anyway, so I was doing that, and then all of a sudden, in the middle of me talking, in the middle of my sermon, you know, I walk back and forth a lot, and I'm a very, you know, I'm pronounced with my motions and whatnot, and I realized there was a breeze, like a draft, <laughs> where I don't normally feel drafts. And so I was like, God, that's weird, what in the world's going on? And so I, I realized that it was my zipper, <laughs> was just the whole way down. And so I'm, I'm continuing to talk, and at the same time I'm preaching and trying to listen to the Holy Spirit, I'm thinking, man, should I just address this and zip it up in front of them, or should I keep going? And I don't know if they'd think I was weird or something. I don't know. It was a big old, it was a big old mess going on in my head. So I came to the conclusion that, yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to address it, turn around, pull up my zipper, and continue on. It'd be embarrassing, but, you know, they'll get over it. So I do that. I said, hey, public service announcement. Some of you may notice, some of you may not. Zipper's down. I'm going to pull it up. So they laughed. They laughed. I turn around, zip the zipper, turn back around, and everyone's laughing harder now. My face was already red, but I was like, what's going on? Why Why is it funnier now that it's up? What's going on? Did it just hit them, what was happening? And then some, some leader in the audience told me that there was a uh, window behind me. And this window, it was dark outside, and it was light in the room. So if you know anything about physics, that window reflected a lot of what was going on. <laughs> and so when I turned around, everyone could see the reflection of what was happening, Thus, they saw me pull up my zipper when I turned around. So I think that's where a lot of my nervousness comes from. And don't worry, I checked like three times before I came up here. (laughs) We're okay. (laughs) It's good. (laughs) So um, thank you, first off, for uh, having Hannah and I and welcoming welcoming us into your family. And as I said, bear with me. My voice cracks sometimes, and I get a little nervous. So um, I'll be sharing a little bit from uh, the prodigal son story, Luke 15, Verse 11, if you want to follow along, feel free to. Um, But what we're going to do today is we're going to do something um, called like rescuing truth from familiarity. The prodigal son story is one that a lot of us may know. And if you don't, you will really know it by the end of this. Um, But if we look at this story, if we look at Luke 15 and take like a, a, a lens Take our Western United States lens 
our United States perspective and just throw it out the window. And we look at this passage through the, the truth of what it was written. It was a Middle Eastern cultural type lens. The Bible was written in the Middle East by Middle Easterners. So if we put that lens on top of this scripture, it doesn't change anything that, you know, we know in our hearts to be true. But there's a lot more meat that we can pull out of it, and there's a lot more depth to this scripture when we understand these little Middle Eastern cultural lens type things. So bear with me. I promise it won't, it won't be that boring that I just said. <laughs> so the um, Pharisees have, adjust, have just accused Jesus of eating with sinners, can't do that. That was one of the laws back then. You can't eat with sinners. And then their pharisaical mindset, I like to think of Pharisees as like really crooked cops that when they see you going one mile an hour over the speed limit, instead of pulling you over and saying, you know, hey, I've seen a lot of accidents. I don't want anything, you to hurt anybody. I don't want you to hurt yourself. They'll just T-bone your car and flip you into a ditch. Because you're one, that's what the Pharisees, that's what their hearts were. There was no love. There was no correction. It was all the rules, all the legalism and all that stuff. So the Pharisees are saying, Jesus, you can't, there's no way you're eating with these sinners. That's against our laws, the laws of God, quote unquote, laws of God. And Jesus responds to them with this story. He does the lost coin, the lost sheep story, and then finishes it with the prodigal son story. And that's where we're going to be today. So in this story, the, the father in the story is a resemblance of Jesus. And the younger son in this story is a resemblance of, you know, the sinner that Jesus is eating with. And then the, the older son in the story is uh, us and the Pharisees, because we're reading the story. So we have the perspective of that older son. So a man, beginning the story, a man asks for his father's, father's inheritance and a lot of you may know this, but in the Middle East, that's basically like saying, Dad, I'd wish you'd be dead. I'd rather you be dead and have your money than you still be around here. Give me my money now. In the Middle East, that's an incredible disrespect. Big time. So culturally, what the father should do, and many fathers have in the same situation in the Middle East, he's supposed to take his left hand, which... The culture says, this is kind of offensive to me because I'm left-handed, but take the left hand, which is worse than the right hand, take the back of the hand and just pia, 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 smack him and out of the house. Nobody would, have, nobody would have said anything different if the father did that because that's what you should do when a, when a son disrespects his father. Every right, go ahead. But the father doesn't in this story. He repurposes that anger, he repurposes that hurt that he feels, and he extends this, this demonstration of love and grace. And it was costly, because when he extended this, he's saying, culturally, you know, I accept this. I should smack you a bunch, but I accept that you wish I was dead. So that's a big thing. And immediately, the Pharisees listening to this story are like, whoa, that doesn't make any sense. That doesn't happen ever. I'm listening now. You got my attention, because this is weird. That's what they're thinking. Jesus is starting to, starting to work them into the story and get them invested, get their, get their minds curious a little bit about what's going on. So the son leaves with this, the inheritance was a third of the, of the property. The son leaves with it and tries to sell it in the village. Hey, man, want to buy this? Hey, man, want to buy this? Because he just wants the cash. Nobody in the village wants to buy it because they can see that there's some kind of breakdown here. They can see something's up. So nobody in the village is, is, is going after this. So the son has to make a really long journey out to the outskirts of the village into the wilderness and find somebody who has no preconceived idea of what's going on. And he sells it. And now he's just walking around with this, just bags and bags of cash. He's spending it on, I don't know what they spent it on, like camels and nice fancy robes and a lot of dinners and nice hostels and stuff. But uh, there's, a, there's a phenomenon known as spilling. A lot of people and a lot of translations put um, adulterous living in this, in this section. That's known as spilling. The original text says nothing of 
adulterous living or, you know, loose living. It's just, he's, he's a kid and he's spending all this money wildly. I remember when I got my first paycheck, I bought a GameCube and a magic set. I was working over there at Whitetail and I got my first paycheck at 14 years old and I bought a GameCube and a magic set. Not good at, I'm still not good at magic and, uh, you know, games are never my thing. But, <laughs> um, so that's what this kid is doing. There's no, like, adulterous type living and we, it takes away from the strength and the, the power of that accusation at the end of the story. And we'll get to that when we put that accusation in here that he was living like this. So, has all this money all his food, all his riding high on the camel, and a famine happens. Spent all the money. There's now a famine. So the only place he can find work, he's not trained in work because he's this younger son who's always been in the house. He's never been trained by his fathers or any servants. So the only place he can find work, adequate work, to make a living to lay, find a place to lay his head is with these pigs. And he's a Jew, a Middle Eastern Jew, and pigs are ceremonially unclean because the Jews think there's demons in pigs. I don't think there's demons in pigs. I enjoy some bacon. But for the, Jew, <laughs> but for the Jewish religion, they think there's demons in pigs, so that just shows the, the, the grossness that this younger son got him, the situation that this younger son got himself into. He's at the lowest of the lowest of the low, and traditionally, he can't just go back home. That's why he finds this pig slop job. Because in the Middle East, they have this thing, and bear with me with, on the pronunciation. If you guys can say it with me, it's kizaza. Okay, good. You guys probably said it better than I. <laughs> but the kizaza ceremony is something in the Middle Eastern culture to where uh, a son shames his father and this ceremony that they do, bear with me again, they just put a bunch of burnt vegetables, burnt corn, burnt nuts in this big pot, and then they smash the pot. And for some reason, that means that the son can never return to the village. So it's a pretty big thing. He doesn't want this ceremony to take place, so he doesn't go back to the village. If he just waltzes in there as he is, they'll kick this pot, and he won't, and he won't be able to come back. So he gets this job, and while he's working this job, we get our first insight into what this son is thinking. We get our first, like, I guess uh, in, in a play it would be called like a soliloquy. Uh, we get this inner dialogue that the son's going through. He starts thinking, I have it pretty rough. How can I return home in a respectable way? The, the slaves that work back home have it better than me, so maybe... I can plead with my father and have him accept me back. The scripture states he, he came to his senses. And sometimes we can take that as, oh, he's repentive. He came to his senses. But this, this he came to his senses is in another part of the Bible. That phrase is in another part of the Bible. And it's in Acts 12, uh, verse 11, when an angel just kicks Peter up out of a jail, breaks the jail, picks him up, and is floating him through the village and then drops him in the middle of the village. And the Bible says that Peter came to his senses, meaning he realized he wasn't dreaming. He realized that what was happening was real. And so that's all that's happening here. This son realizes that his situation is rough. He just realizes it. There's no repenting yet. Well, you could say the next thing that he says it seems pretty repentive, and I thought he was repentive. I have sinned before heaven and in your sight. That seems pretty noble. But the Pharisees listening, who had an incredible knowledge of Scripture, would have understood that exact phrase, that exact translation, I have sinned before heaven and in your sight, was a quote from Exodus 10.16, where Pharaoh was trying to manipulate Moses into lifting these plagues. So all this son is doing, he's trying to, like, soften up his old man. He's trying to butter him up. He's trying to manipulate his, his father into taking him back without doing this whole ceremony. He's trying to come back in a way that he won't be shunned forever.
He also asked for job training because in order to pay back this debt, because all that's in his son's head is the debt, you know, I need to pay the debt in order to be right in my village. He asked his dad, make me one of your hired servants. Allow me to work, allow me to, to learn how to work so I can one day work and one day pay back this debt and then one day I'll be acceptable in this village again. He's thinking, me, 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 I, what can I do? How can I make this right? He still thinks it's about the money he squandered. He's still thinking, me, I, I, me, 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 me. But it's not about the money. It's about his father's broken heart. It's about the weight of that decision to say, Dad, give me that inheritance. He's not thinking about what it costs the father. The son sees himself, at this point in the story, the son sees himself as a servant before a son of a beautiful, loving father. That's all he's thinking in his head. I'm just a servant. And the father, a beautiful, loving father that he is, from the moment the son left, his eyes were just scanning the horizon. His arms were out, knowing that his son will someday come back, hopeful. And he's just looking. He was constantly looking. I imagine him just pacing back and forth at the door, his heart just on a stick for this son that shamed him and hurt him so much. And he's just, he wants the connection. He wants that return home so bad. So the son, he's on the outskirts of the village. He's still lost. He's just thinking, he's going over this speech in his head over and over and over again, making sure he gets it right, says all the things he needs to say in order to become a slave of the house and then And the father sees him. And immediately takes off. Lifts up his robe. A lot of you may know that they they don't, Middle Eastern men can't run. They're not allowed to lift up their robe and expose their ankles and so they're not allowed to run like that in public. The father has every right, culture says, to just sit back in a chair, wait for the son to come to the house because he's the man of the house and say, What do you have to say for yourself, young man? He has every right to do that. Nobody would have shaken a stick at him for doing that because that's, that's culturally what is acceptable. But no, he takes off. The son's still lost, and this father is running with all of his might to him. And that's a beautiful picture of the gospel. A stunning picture that while we were just lost and gross in our sin, Jesus was running. Jesus' eyes were always on the horizon. His arms were out. And if there's anyone in here this morning that that realization hits you, that it's just free. You don't have any debt to repay. There's There's no weight that'll keep you away from the Lord. The Lord's waiting to lift that weight. The Lord's running towards you. And that's free. That's free for anyone in here. So the father then just throws his arms around this boy, hugs his neck and and kisses him on the face, and he's overjoyed. He's just excited. And the son says, I have sinned before heaven and in your sight. And he stops. That act, that costly public display of love and grace, broke this younger son. Had the son been able to just walk all the way back up to the house, enter the house again, he would have just been thinking of me, 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 me. But the fact that that father ran, hugged him, and kissed him, He said that line in true sincerity because he quit. He ended it right there. I have sinned before heaven and in your sight. He didn't say anything about the job training. And how we know that the the son was really 
truly in repentance in this moment. The father turns around to everybody looking because it's a, it's a spectacle now. <laughs> Everyone in the village can see what's going on. He turns around and says, we're going to have a party. Kill any kind of animal you can find. <laughs> we're going to have a party. We're going to barbecue it up, and we're going to celebrate because this son was lost, but he's here. Not he's back, not his physical return. Who he is in himself is here. He's here again. Beautiful. And that's free for any, anybody, any single person. So, continuing on with the story, we get a little scene change here, if you will. Pya! Flash to the older brother. Older brother's just working out in the field, doing his thing. I don't know what they planted, or I don't know. That's what I imagine. I'm a very visual guy. <laughs> He's just working, and then he starts to hear this, like, this music or something. These, this, this party. I don't know. Again, I don't know. <laughs> but he hears the party. And so he starts wandering through this village, trying to figure out where in the world that music's coming from. Because it's a party. Everyone kind of gets sucked into a party. You know what I mean? Music's loud. Atmosphere's fun. So he's looking. And then he turns a corner, and he just realizes, ooh, that's coming from my house. That's weird. And so he stays. He stays a little bit of the way. He just stays off the, the, the outskirts of the property a little bit and just crosses his arms. He's just looking. Culture tells us that as soon as that older son, he's the oldest son in the household, in the Middle East, when he realizes a party's happening, he doesn't have to find out a thing, who the party's for, you know, how many people are at the party. He doesn't think about that. Middle Eastern culture tells us he just bolts off and becomes the new face of the party. He's supposed to take all the weight off of his father's shoulders, say, oh, no, give, give me this plate, give me these cups, I'll serve everybody. You sit, you relax with your friends and celebrate. The oldest son is supposed to be a servant. He's supposed to become that new face of the party, making sure everyone has everything uh, covered, anything they need. But does he do that? He just continues to stay there. And this, this act, this, you know, public thing, everyone in that village would have known that this, brother, this older brother was being disobedient. This is even more of a, of a slap in the face, a gouge in the heart of the father, because this is in, this is in public. That, that inheritance thing, sure, it hurt a lot, but it was in the, in the privacy of their home. But this is in public. Everyone in the party can see this defiance, this unwillingness to participate, unwillingness to join and serve the family. It's a pretty big deal. So this son is standing there, and a servant runs by doing something, servanty. And he says, hey, what's, what's this party for? What's this thing about? And the servant says, oh, you didn't hear. Your brother is here. Not your brother is back. Once again, your brother is here. And your father has killed the fatted calf because of, and there's a Hebrew word here, because of shalom. Shalom meaning complete peace and reconciliation. Meaning any type of debt is gone. If the servant would have said anything else here, if it was for the physical return, oh, you know, younger brother's back, yippee, he would have just run in there, become the face, and then when everyone left, he would have been able to shout and share his opinion about, you know, kick him out until he pays this debt. Kizaza this man up. Kick that pot. Get him out of here. But because this servant used the word shalom, meaning complete peace and reconciliation, 
There is no debt for him to shout about. There is nothing, no angle, no leverage that this older brother has to kick his younger son out. And that's what just sets him off. He says, "Mm mm-mm, this is ridiculous. There's no way. Shalom. Shalom? Did you say shalom? (laughs) Because it was. Everything was paid for. So the father has seen this, this disregard, this disrespect. Culturally, Middle Eastern culture tells us that when that happens, he can just ignore him and continue on with the party, let him stand there until his feet are numb or he gets tired and walks away, you know, just ignore him. But for the third time in the story, the father displays this really costly, and this time public, demonstration of love. And he walks out to him. He walks out to this, like, gross, sad, and broken-hearted older son, just all this junk in his, he walks out to him. Once again, putting his heart on the line, putting his heart on a stick when he has every right to just ignore him. And he says, what's wrong? Celebrate with us. What's going on? And here we see the true just uh, grossness in this older son's heart. He gets jealous. He starts throwing accusations. He said, this man squandered all of your money with prostitutes and, and all this stuff. And this is the weight of the, from the beginning of the story. Accusations like that still to this day in the Middle East get people killed. If there's an accusation, even if it's just, you know, a fleeting thing and there's no proof, an accusation like that, people die over it. So that's the weight of this older brother's just jealousy and hatred towards his younger son, towards this celebration. And he's shouting. It's basically like if you had a a beautiful celebration wedding, and for the toast, this older brother gets up and just starts shouting and hurling insults at the, at the groom. That's basically the, the picture of what's going on here. There's this beautiful celebration. And he's just shouting in the face of it. So, Middle Eastern culture tells us the father has every right to just find the nearest jail cell, drag him by the ear, or however they did it back then, throw him in the jail cell, lock it, swallow it, I don't know. But he has every right to just lock him up. But he doesn't. In beautiful consistency, the father extends more love and grace, and he just, some scholars say he gets down on his knees and pleads for joy in this older son's heart. Be happy. There's so much to be happy for. This soul that was lost is back. And then, story's over. Just like that. Jesus ended this story really strategically because he put himself on stage in the form of the Father on his knees pleading for joy. And he put the Pharisees and us as the the reader on stage in the form of this calloused older brother. And that question for us is, what are we going to do when Jesus is just pleading for joy in front of us, on his knees, understanding all of our, you know, situations, all of our stuff, When he's pleading for joy and our attitude is just abrasive and against it and jealous and gross, and Jesus is pleading for joy, what are we going to do with that? How are we going to respond to a man that has every right to lock us up? And he's on his knees in front of us, in front of everybody. What are we going to do with that? 
So that's question number one. What are we going to do with that? Question number two is an obvious one. Are we even a, a smidge of a representation of that father in the story? When we've been wronged so many times, when our hearts have just been gouged and hurt, do we repurpose that and try to be a reflection of Jesus? Do we change our, our thinking, change our cultural norms, our preconceived notions of how justice is supposed to be? And do we extend grace and love? And I mean, I'm, I'm preaching to myself too. These questions hit me hard. And I try to, on, a, on a daily, on an hourly, on a, like a minutely basis, I try my hardest to think about this. Am I being like that father? And the third question, and this is a very interesting one, because when I started um, studying this, I didn't even know I had this question until uh, I studied. The, this comes from a, a teaching by a guy named Kenneth Bailey. But the biggest question is, why did the younger brother run away in the first place? So he has, get this, he has this father who's consistently showed himself to be true, to be loving, to be gracious. Why would he run away? I said, wow, that's a good question. Why did he want to run away? And Middle Eastern culture, I promise that's the last time I'm going to say that. <laughs> Middle Eastern culture, ah, darn it. <laughs> That culture tells us that in that kind of family dynamic, in the Middle East, the older brother is responsible for the emotional, the spiritual, the physical well-being of any siblings underneath of him. So the reason this younger brother wanted nothing to do with this family was because there was a poor representation of our father. He wasn't being spiritually cared for. He wasn't being emotionally cared for, physically cared for. Because this older brother was all about rules and legalism. And, and that, that one hits me the closest to home. How many times do I let my opinions my, you know, justice-oriented, driven life push people away that the Lord has put in my life, made me responsible for. And this goes right along with what we were um, in our, the, that morning prayer time. The Lord puts people, put, makes us responsible for certain people in our path to love, to reach out to. How many times do we just let, and, and I'm not saying like just let everything go, like, you know, grace covers all, and well, it does cover all, but you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> you have to be trying to make an effort to, to serve the Lord and live with the Lord, but you cannot approach situations like that if there's no relational debt. If, there, if you haven't started a relationship, you can't just go shouting at people on the street, stop sinning, stop doing this, stop doing that. Love them first. Say, hey man, what's going on? Tell me about your life. Sit there for more than five minutes with somebody. Begin to create relationship. Begin to show the love of Christ through that. And then in that moment, when that person opens up or you feel you have an opening, sure, help them understand that what they're doing is going to lead to their death and an eternity in hell. Better words than that, but <laughs> that's the reality of it though. We as Christians don't want anyone to, to live a life like that, to perish like that. So why, including myself, why are we not creating relationships? Why are we not reaching out and loving as well as we can? And in this room, I understand there is 
powerful people in here, and the, the potential in this room, if you guys, um, and again, it was in, this is weird, it was in the, the morning prayer uh, time. If we reach out, Pastor Joe Pickens, Pastor Beautiful Blake <laughs> can't have the same circles as you. They can't sit at your dinner table every night. They can't go to the place where you work. They can't enter your friend circles. You be the representation. Be the church outside of the church. Be the representation of Christ in those circles. Because in that, in being a reflection of Christ, with the help of the Holy Spirit, you will cause freedom to well up inside people. You will cause questions and seeds of the Holy Spirit to begin to grow inside of them. And each and every one of us are called to do that, to be missional in our thinking, to constantly keep our eyes on the horizon, to keep our heart on a stick. I know, I know you, you can hurt this. You're, a, you're an unsaved person and you say nasty things. I know you can crush my heart with one word but I'm willing if that heart crush means that you come to know a beautiful Lord, a Savior full of grace, a Savior full of freedom through me. Hallelujah for that. Each and every one of you in this room have the power through Christ to be that for people. When I, so I kind of hinted on it earlier, I was piddling around the streets of Mercersburg, this lost kid, my friend invited me to a youth group. We were, we'd, uh, we were doing unmentionable, like substance abuse and stuff like that. And for some reason, we just ran out of money one Wednesday night. And I didn't want to stay at home because I was just a sad kid and I didn't like home. And he said, hey, man, I know a place where we can go. We can hang out. And we don't have to be here at home. And I said, okay, cool. And he said, okay, we're going to youth group. And I said, that's ridiculous. There's no way you're going to get me to go to that youth group. My hair was down to like my shoulders here. And it was just, I never washed it. My nicest pair of jeans were torn from the ankle all the way to the knee. And so <laughs> I was just flopping around looking like an elephant or something. And just for some reason, it must, looking back on it, it was the Holy Spirit. We just ran out of money on, on Wednesdays. And he kept asking me. And the third time he asked me, the third week, I said, yeah, okay, I'll go. I took a shower, and I safety pinned my pants. <laughs> but I, I, I went, and I felt the peace of the Lord for the first time. I didn't know what that was at that point, but I felt the peace of the Lord. And I, so I continued to go. It was a beautiful place of, like, I could, these people weren't judging me. These people weren't pushing me away. I thought they were going to, but they're okay with me being here. This is interesting. So I kept going, and then the kid finally, I guess he got convicted, hallelujah, that he got convicted. He told the youth pastor what we were involved with, and I said, ah, well, here we go. I'm getting kicked out of a place that I really loved, and I felt safe here, because that, that was my view. You know, you had to be all polished. That's why I safety pinned my pants and took a shower. You had to be all polished to enter uh, a church to, you know, be a part of that. So I went over to fight the kid because I loved that place. And I didn't know why I loved it at the time. It was the Lord, but I loved that place. I went over to push him up against the wall, but I was like a foot away from him, and the youth pastor said, hey, come here. Come into my office, Sean. And I said, ah, I didn't even get to punch anybody on the way out. <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> and so I, I walked into his office, and he, he sat me down, and he said, hey, man, how can I pray for you? What's going on? What's up? And he loved me. He took the time to build a relationship with me and ask me about me. He could have easily, he had every right. I was bringing some, some gross stuff into his, into his youth group. Some stuff that could have derailed his character, could have derailed a lot of his students. But he took that risk. And he loved me. And right there on that couch, I said, okay, that doesn't make any sense. I should have been kicked out. What's, inside, what's in you? What is, what is Jesus? And so we had a conversation, and I ended up accepting the Lord right there in that office. But each and every one of you, the Lord puts people in your life like that. 
It could be a dangerous thing, and obviously, like, walk in wisdom with it and pray about it and stuff. Don't just, like, <laughs> go into the middle of Baltimore in the ghettoist spot and start, you know, loving, trying to make friends with people. I mean, if that's what the Lord calls you. To. Anyway, we're just digging, we're digging ourselves a hole. I'm <laughs> we're digging ourselves a hole. But the Lord has called each and every one of us to love like that, to be like this father, to push away any type of cultural stuff, any type of, you know, we have the right to do it. The Lord is love, and he's loving each and every one of you, and I, fe I feel like this church is really good at doing that. From the moment I walked in, you guys are love. Grow that, cultivate that, continue to be that for this community, for your families, for your workplaces. Because there's no, there's no cap on the amount of freedom that the Lord can work in through you for other people. That same joy that you have in knowing that your final resting place is heaven, that same joy you get when you're just a servant serving the Lord and loving people, you can do that to, for other people. You can be that. You can teach them. So I'm going to pray. Is that okay? Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to pray. Um, and that's us. That's Hannah and I. We are just day by day loving people, choosing to keep our hearts open and on a, on a stick no matter what happens. So um, if there's, if you felt touched by any type of anything and you feel you need prayer, for more of that, please come see Hannah or I or anyone else. Blake's a good guy. <laughs> um, or if, you're, if you don't know Jesus in this place and you never realize that there's just somebody running towards you the whole time and there's no debt, um, I or Blake, again, Blake or I or Hannah, would love to pray for you. So, uh, Lord, we thank you for Christian life. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that lives here. Thank you for what you're doing in these hearts. Thank you for the, the power of your presence in worship. Thank you for the burden that you've placed on each individual here. Thank you that they've loved so much already and they've done so much already. But Lord, until we take that last breath, we're still serving you. We're still reflecting your love to each and every person. We're being stern when we need to be stern. We're, we're preaching your word when we need to preach your word, and we're loving when we need to love. Help us to, to hear that. Help us to know your voice better. You are bigger than we could ever imagine. Your ways are vast. Your ways are uh, beyond our comprehension. We're like ants trying to understand algebra. But Jesus, help us to even just get a glimpse of your ways. Let your will be done, Father. Help each and every one of us just to love you more and through that, reflect that to other people. Jesus, I pray that for uh, you put more people in our path to practice to, to practice on how to put our heart out on a stick and, and deal with all those emotions through you. But ultimately, Lord, just your will, your will, your will. Holy Spirit, begin to burn in each and every one of us. If we're already burning, Lord, add some more logs to it. Hallelujah, Lord. We love you. Amen. Thank you, guys. We love you. <laughs> Can we just thank them? I'm going to invite Hannah back up here real quick. If the ushers could uh, go ahead and prepare themselves. We're, like I said earlier, we're going to take up a special offering 
for this amazing couple. Um, and, and I just want to say, like, I, I see that reflection. You guys really do reflect Christ and everything, and, and, and you, you guys are striving. And, and I'm excited to see and hear the testimonies of, of what happens in Ecuador because of that, that light that's in you that's, that's shining forth. And so if you guys are interested in, like, partnering with them in this moment, you're like, hey, something they said, something uh, they're going to be doing, like, connects with me, uh, uh, take that step. Just just give generously towards them today, and uh, we just want to bless them. And so I'm just going to pray you guys can go ahead and start ushers uh, going around. Let's just let's just pray for this this young couple uh, as as we uh, uh, start to take this offering. Lord, we just uh, uh, again are just so grateful to be in this place. Uh, so grateful to to have the opportunity to hear uh, Sean and Hannah's heart, Lord. Uh, Lord God, we, we are uh, amazed uh, at, at the the change and the transformation that that you've you've uh, uh, had in their lives um, through through their testimony and through their story, Lord God. And we're so so excited. Uh, uh, to hear the story and to hear uh, the testimony um, uh, of what's going to happen as you continue to, to birth a, a passion in them for uh, you, Lord, uh, but for the people of Ecuador, uh, for those orphans and for those special needs uh, uh, kids, Lord God, and, and uh, uh, people who are who are forgotten and pushed aside, Lord God. Uh, and so, Lord, I just pray that you would bless uh, abundantly uh, this young couple, Lord God, as they uh, uh, strive to do uh, what you've called them to do, Lord God. And again, and we, we pray for guidance uh, as you shine a light in their path, Lord God, and, and, and bring them uh, to and through uh, what uh, you're going to do. Uh, and so, God, we just, uh, again, just want to say thank you, and we praise you for this young couple and the ministry that they're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So we, we love you guys. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'm going to uh, let you guys sneak out to the, to the foyer. If you guys want to uh, talk with them, they're going to be out there um, now. Uh, to talk. So just, just hey, if you want to have more conversation with them and hear more about what they're going to be doing and uh, what their heart is, please have a conversation with them. Grab a grab a card from them for the, uh, that has their info um, that you can be praying for them and stuff like that. Uh, real quick, I just wanted to say uh, uh, we, we got word that uh, uh, I don't know if many of you know who he is, but Josh Thomas, uh, uh, Josh and Natalie are a young couple that have been coming here for a little bit. Uh, uh, we got word that he's being, I don't even know really what's happening, but uh, that he's like going to the ER or he's at the ER now uh, having some sort of issue. And so we just want to real quick uh, pray over that situation right now. Um, and so why don't you just pray with me uh, this morning. So Lord, we just lift up Josh uh, to you, Lord. Uh, pray that you uh, you would touch, uh, meet him right now where he is in the ER, Lord God. That your healing power uh, would fill that room in the name of Jesus. Uh, we don't know what the situation is, Lord God, but we trust that you have your hand uh, upon him, and we declare in the name of Jesus uh, some healing to take place right now, Lord God, uh, that the doctors would be would see, see immediate uh, results or immediate uh, progress in, in whatever is the health issue that's going on, Lord God, uh, and we trust and believe that you're going to, to do a mighty work right now in, in this moment. Uh, bring peace uh, to that whole family, Lord God. Bring peace and, and, and comfort uh, in this, this scary and stressful time. Uh, we just pray and, 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 and uh, ask that you would do this in the name of Jesus, and we, we're excited to hear about the testimony that comes uh, from this. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You guys are all awesome. Thank you guys for being here this morning. Uh, God bless you, um, and have a great Memorial Day.